This briefing package on biotechnology and emergent diseases will be done in two sessions. And we're going to get into this topic for three reasons. First of all, it is a prophetically relevant strategic trend. We monitor a dozen trends. This is one of them that will impact your life and mine. It also has a biblical relevance. But a second reason that we're undertaking this review is that biotechnology offers one of the most profound epistemological discoveries of our time. Epistemology is the study of knowledge, its scope and limits. And microbiology has shattered the foundations of our assumptions about reality. And the evidence for intelligent design is overwhelming. The third reason that we want to get into this is that biotechnology is one of the most potentially dangerous technologies in the hands of the unbridled. Now it's prophetically relevant in a number of places. In Matthew 24, that intimate discourse by Jesus with his insiders, his four key disciples, he says, For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines, and pestilences, and earthquakes in divers places. All these are the beginning of birth pangs, or sorrows. A very famous passage, but I want you to notice among this, these series of catastrophic so, uh, signs, signs of our times, is pestilences. We also find that, that Jesus goes on to say, Except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. You know, most people don't recognize that verse 22 of Matthew 24 is a technology statement. If we were reading that verse, say, during the Civil War, in, say, 1860 or so, that might not have the impact on us because we can't visualize the world wiping itself out with muskets and bayonets. And yet, the nuclear cloud, for one, hangs over every geopolitical decision on the planet Earth. And also, in addition, the potential of biological weapons is really quite terrifying. In the book of Revelation, most of us have recognized that it has a, sep a heptatic structure, a sevenfold structure. There are seven seals and then seven trumpets and seven bowls. And the first four seals of the seven seals are called the four horsemen. They've become an idiom in our literature, the four horsemen of the apocalypse. There's a white horse, a red horse, and a black horse, representing conquest, wars, and famine. And the fourth one is the green horse. The word is actually chloros, translated pale in your Bible probably, but it's actually green. It's a chloros, a color of chlorine, the green horse. And it, of course, is death. And uh, it says in Revelation chapter 6, verse 7, starting, it says, When he had opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth beast say, Come and see. And I looked, and behold, a pale horse, or if I may, a chloros horse. And his name that sat on him was death. And hell followed with him. And power was given unto them over a fourth part of the earth to kill with the sword and with hunger and with death and with the beasts of the earth. Now we should recognize that uh, these beasts are not necessarily four-footed mammals. These beasts could be beasts that you have to look at through a microscope. And we get to Ezekiel 14, Thus saith the Lord God, How much more when I send my four ju sword judgments on Jerusalem, the sword, the famine, and the noisome beast, and the pestilence to cut off from it man and beast, and so forth. So we find these echoes throughout the prophetic scriptures. Four sword judgments and pestilence being the one of the climactic ones. Well, let's talk a little bit about reemergent and deliberate diseases. We don't think of deliberate diseases very often. But uh, this is the dark side, if you will, of our global health report. You know, with the advent of bio antibiotics about 50 years ago, scientists predicted the end of death and suffering from infectious diseases. That was 50 years ago. But during the past 25 years, however, we have witnessed the reemergence and geographical spread of well-known diseases, including tuberculosis, malaria, cholera, often in more virulent and drug-resistant forms than before. So things have gotten more precarious than ever. Diseases that were once thought to be obsolete have once again become a global threat. 
In recent years, new pathogens have emerged, some of which carry antibiotic-resistant genes or mutations, enabling them to move across different species. Scientists have also identified more than 30 previously unknown diseases like HIV and Ebola, for which today there is still no known cure. Infectious diseases remain the leading cause of death worldwide and the third leading cause of death in the United States, according to the National Institute of Health. So we have a war against diseases, obviously cancer, heart diseases, HIV, AIDS, autoimmune diseases, Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's, Huntington's disease, Lou Gehrig's disease, mental illness, even obesity is a, a, a considered a serious threat. Cancer, of course, is the leading cause of death after heart disease, about 24%. 40% of Americans have or will have cancer. 20% will die from it. 30% of that has been caused by smoking. 30% by poor diet and lack of exercise. There's an interesting phenomenon they've discovered that the scientists call quorum sensing. It turns out that there are some bacteria that actually take roll before attacking. They seem to take muster to see if there's enough of them to have a chance of winning before they attack. They call this quorum sensing. And there are E. coli, uh, salmonella, vibro cholera, and 30 others that have this peculiar capability. We're talking single-celled creatures that take role before charging in. It sort of reminds you of Luke 14. What king going to, to make war against another king sitteth not down first and consulteth whether he is able with 10,000 to meet him that cometh against him with 20,000? Or else while the other is yet a great way off, he sendeth an ambassage to, and desireth conditions of peace. That's, of course, talking about real kings and real wars. But yet, uh, it's interesting, we almost see that being acted out by the bacteria. Some facts to ponder. This is uh, kind of interesting. If you take the number of physicians in the United States, which has been estimated 700,000, and take the accidental deaths caused by physicians per year, uh, being about 120,000, that means the accidental deaths per physician is about 0.171, according to the Department of Health, uh, Health Human Services. The number of gun owners in the United States is 80,000, excuse me, 80 million. The number of gun owners in the United States is 80 million. The accidental gun deaths per year is about 1,500. The accidental deaths per gun owner, according to the FBI, is about 0 .000188. In other words, doctors apparently are 9,000 times as dangerous as gun owners. Now, that's statistically. Now, you should alert your friends to this alarming threat. We must ban doctors before this gets totally out of hand. Of course, out of concern for the public at large, I've withheld statistics on lawyers for fear that the shock might cause them to seek medical attention. <laughs> and of course, this whole thing is facetious. It's been circulating on the internet for several years as a gag. No one seems to dispute the statistics. They do dispute the logic, but I, I submit it just to be colorful. I wouldn't suggest you take this seriously. But let's do take some seriously. I'd like to include a preface here, a tutorial perspective that we need to have before getting into our subject material, and that's microbiology. I want you to see this as a constellation of miracles that occur within a miniature city. You know, if we make a map of our reality, we can start with the human body, which is made up of organs, which in turn is made up of tissues, which in turn is made up of cells. The cells inside the cells are molecular robots that have an atomic structure of uh, subatomic particles and so on. And the, you get smaller than subatomic particles, we now discover the entities there do not have locality. So that's another whole fascinating study of quantum physics. But let's, we're really going to focus on the cells and the molecular robots. So we're going to move down below the body, the organs, the tissues, down to the cells, and take a look at what we're encountering there. Michael Denton published a landmark book in, eight, in 1966 called Evolution, colon, A Theory in Crisis. Very interesting book in which he demonstrates that evolution is lo no longer a viable explanation for what we know about the universe. But one of his remarks he makes is, that, speaking of cells, he says, although the tiniest bacterial cells are incredibly small, each is, in effect, a veritable micro-miniaturized factory containing thousands of exquisitely designed pieces of intricate molecular machinery 
made up of a hundred billion atoms, far more complicated than any machine built by man and absolutely without parallel in the non-living world. We, you know, Darwin used to like to talk about the simple cell. We've all heard about the so-called simple cell. It turns out it doesn't exist. The simplest cell we can encounter has unparalleled complexity and adaptive design. It has a central memory bank. It has assembly plants and processing units, repackaging and shipping centers, robot machines, protein molecules that are robot machines, typically consisting of 3,000 atoms in three-dimensional configurations. It has hundreds of thousands different specific types. It has elaborate communication systems and quality control and repair mechanisms throughout. If we were to make a model of a simple cell, let's imagine a model that's 1,000 million times larger than reality. In other words, a billion larger than reality. Each atom, we'll assume, will be about the size of a tennis ball. We will need 10 million million atoms, 10 to the 13th. If we counted one per minute, it would take 19 million years just to count these. I want you to get a feeling for the scope of this, so, this imaginary model. It would be over 10 miles in diameter. It's a, so the real cell, of course, has a, is enclosed by a plasma membrane, which has gateways that control exchanges going in and going out with signal receptors. The internal material they call cytoplasm, inside of which is the nucleus. That's actually an information center with a master library that has all the background they need. There's a nucleus, nucleolus, which is the automated factories that m manufacture products that will be used by the cell. There are a number of mitochondrions, which are the power plants, the sources of energy to have all this activity go on. It has what they call the Golgi apparatus, which is for processing, packaging, shipping, and preparing for export from the cell. And there are all kinds of other functions for storage and transport and trash disposal. This is literally a miniature city. There are automated factories in the cell, robot machines, hundreds of thousands of different types that have an artificial language and decoding systems, memory banks for information storage, elegant control systems for automated assembly of the components. They prefab and use modular construction. They have error fail safe and proofreading devices for quality control and on it goes. I spent some years as a senior executive with Ford Motor Company. In those days, in Dearborn, one of our proudest assets was the Ford River Rouge plant, a plant on the River Rouge. The Ford River Rouge plant is the largest integrated manufacturing plant in the world. Let's take a quick look at it. It, it has ore docks where raw ore comes in. It has steel furnaces, coke ovens, rolling mills, glass furnaces, and plate glass rollers. It makes its own steel, its own glass, and its own paint. It consists of 93 buildings, a tire making plant, a stamping plant, an engine casting plant, a frame and assembly plant, a radiator plant, tool and die plant, paper mill, and a soybean conversion plant. So you have raw materials enter this complex. It is supported with a massive power plant 120 miles of conveyors, 100 miles of railroad track, and at the time, 16 locomotives. Can you get, get this picture? Out of, the raw ore comes in one end, and new cars come out the other end. One every 49 seconds. That's the River Rouge plant. Well worth a tour, even a day with its reduced scale. Let's make a technology comparison. The Ford River Rouge plant has raw limestone, iron ore, coal going one end. It manufactures its own steel gla and glass and paint. It has an automated engine manufacturing line. It assembles mixed models, options, and colors. New cars exit the other end. So get that in your mind. The simple cell is more complex than the Ford River Rouge plant in Dearborn, Michigan. And the cell can do something that the River Rouge plant can't do. It can replicate its entire structure within a few hours. The River Rouge plant can't do that. So you need to understand the complexity of what we're dealing with here. Now the code that drives all this was uh, uh, deciphered, if you will, by Watson and Crick in, in their famous 
landmark publication in Nature Magazine 1953. And of course, in recent years, the big move was to map the human genome. The basic building blocks inside this area is amino acids. Amino acids are the components from which proteins are made. Of the hundreds of amino acids that are known, only 20 are used by living systems in the construction of proteins. And incidentally, only the ones that are left-handed. If you have an asymmetrical molecule, it can be either left or right-handed. It turns out that all amino acids that are used in living tissues are left-handed. The right-handed ones are actually lethal, which tells you, by the way, it couldn't happen accidentally. Because if you have randomness, you'll have half of each, and half of them will destroy the other half. No, there's something guiding all this. Most proteins are simply a linear sequence of somewhere between 100 and 500 amino acids. Some are hydrophobic, that is, they are insoluble in water, and some are hydrophilic, and they are soluble in water. We'll come back to that. But the 20 amino acids that make up life are listed here. And I won't go through them and mispronounce them, but uh, these are obviously well known to those of you that are in microbiology. Half of them are hydrophobic. They're non-soluble in water. They're called nonpolar. The other half are polar or soluble in water. Of the ones that are soluble, some of them are basic, that is, they, uh, they're positively charged, and some of them are acidic, have an extra electron, if you will. And so those are the, those are the basic building materials. Uh, proteins are basically a chain of these things. And I'll just take three as an example. The triazine molecule there is a hydrocarbon of a certain structure. It's not important to us what it is. Glutamine is, a, again, a hydrocarbon, different, different combination of hydrocarbons, and valine, a, a different set of hydrocarbons. The point is, each one of these molecules have an amino group and a carboxyl group that cause them to chain, intrinsically become a chain, and that becomes very critical to the whole structure. Now, there is an alphabet, a nucleic alphabet, that is a three out of four error-correcting digital code. The DNA is coded with four, an alphabet of four, adenine, thymine, quinine, and cytosine, and we're, we're going to just abbreviate those with the letters, an ATGC. It turns out those molecules are such that they have a natural affinity in pairs. You can take those, you can take three of those four, and by using three of those four, you can code any one of the 20 amino acids that make up life. You actually even have some space for punctuation, stop and start codes, if you will. But that's the DNA code. And it can be presented another way, circularly, but that is the famous DNA code. And it has start and stop codes and so forth. Now, as we take this uh, alphabet, we can take those in pairs. The A's and the T's and the G's and C's have a tendency to naturally link with each other. So if we make a molecule of a chain of those things, it will intrinsically pull a matching pair alongside it, if you will. When it splits right down the middle, the matching pairs will join them, and this, in effect, gives you a code that is intrinsically, that will copy itself. Because you can tear this in half and end up with two copies of the same thing. It's an intrinsically self-replicating uh, code because of the complementary pairs. Now, the way this all works, the DNA is the master blueprint for everything else going on. But you don't, you don't take it out of the library. You make a copy of it to work from, a working copy. So you transcribe the DNA into what's called an RNA. That's like a photocopy, if you will. And that RNA will be used then at the factory floor to manufacture the proteins that become the functional machines that are going to be need, needed. Now, the Crick dogma was that you go from DNA to RNA to proteins. You can't go backwards. We now discover that's not true. There are things called retroviruses. There are diseases that can get in the proteins that will actually go back and alter the master record. And that's where we get genetically transmittable diseases. Now, if we take the DNA, what happens, interestingly enough, you take a stream of codes that make up the DNA. You, want, you make a copy of that called the RNA. Then the RNA is, is, is edited. They take certain, the machines take certain segments out of it. These are called introns. They're removed. 
and uh, what's left is resealed up to be the messenger RNA that goes to the factory floor. The point I'd like to make is interesting is that we have here an equidistant letter sequence, the same kind of codes that we find in the Bible, strangely enough. These introns are labeled in many textbooks as junk DNA. Scientists felt that the, the introns were removed because they apparently have no functional purpose in producing proteins, so they thought that these are just left over from evolution or some past time. They call it junk DNA. The shocker is they now have discovered two things. Number one, that these, the junk DNA, as it's called, actually is, has an architectural role in what follows. But the really, the big shocker to me was to discover that, you know what percent of the DNA was considered junk DNA? 95%. It's only 5% that's actually uh, f focused on for the proteins. Now, when you get the RNA, there's a slight change in the code, but it works the same way. Instead of the ATGC, we're going to have AUGC, but that, that's uh, just a mechanical thing. And those four letters, we're going to take a look at. If we take messenger RNA that is a sequence of protein that we want, there are recording heads. The transfer to RNA comes by, and there, it operates like a recording head in the recording studio. As it moves, it pulls together, it assembles the proteins that are encrypted in the codes that it's reading. And that's the way it will build a, a, the sequence of amino acids that will make up the protein that it's after. It can make up several hundred thousand different kinds of machines. This is a machine building another machine. Now, negatively charged groups will associate with positively charged groups. The hydrophobic side of the chains will stack in the center, and the hydrophilic will, that, that will arrange themselves in surface contact. So depending on its polarities and depending on its relationship to water, it will take a three-dimensional shape that allows it to perform the functions that it's designed for. The final stable three-dimensional shape, the minimum energy conformation, is dictated by spe the specific amino acid sequence. Now, one of the things you need to get a feeling for is the ultimate technology is not the media in which the, the, the codes are, are expressed. Thoughts are always expressed in a language. Try to think of the difference between the technology of conveyance versus the technology of content. Or putting it another way, the media versus the manuscript. Did the ink write the book? You can talk a lot about ink and paper and technology of bookmaking. It's got nothing to do with the thoughts and the meaning of the words in the book. Understand the differences here. The elements of language in includes semantics. Every element has a meaning. The famous one-bit binary message in Paul Revere's ride, the, the light uh, across the river was one if by land, two if by sea. That was the semantics. That one light told them what they needed to know. But it also required syntax. That, that piece of information had to be in the right expected place. And um, the Old North Church, a lantern that was somewhere else, didn't have any meaning. And so the most advanced computers could not have broken Paul Revere's code because it was, it was a digital code. It was an arbitrary definition. Now, did this happen by random accident, or is it evidence design? Obviously, that whole procedure, the code across the river, Paul Revere's response to that was by arrangement. Someone designed that procedure. Now, at this point, I'd like to show you something. I have here a string of beads. I should explain how this came about. I was in my workshop, and I happened to spill a bunch of black and white beads on the floor. As I picked them up, I said, I didn't want that to happen again, so I decided to put them on a string. I picked them up randomly and put them on the string. And, I, and here they are. There's a, a bunch of string, uh, uh, beads here. But as I looked at it, I noticed something very strange. I noticed that some black, there's, there's two white ones. That in Morse code is an I. Dit, dit is an I. Then a dash dot, that's an N in Morse code. And then there's a T and an H. And I realized this spells a message in Morse code. In the beginning, B E G, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. In the, this string of beads in Morse code spells out the first verse in the Bible. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And that happened by random chance. You're laughing, you're smiling. Would I lie to you? 
Yeah, probably. No, obviously, as I tell this story, trying to be serious, you tell right away I'm putting you on because you know in your heart of hearts that it's not likely that these beads were arrived in any specific order. It, to, it happens to be Genesis 1.1. You, don't, you haven't done the math, but if I take the alphabet of two and multiply it by the number of beads in the chain, the probability of any particular sequence is one part in two raised to that power, 347th power. And uh, if you run that math out, it's equivalent to 10 with 104 zeros after it, which is defined in physics as absurd. So your instinct in disbelieving my little story is well placed, even though you may not have the math. Let's take a more complicated example. Let's take the chemical composition of hemoglobin in your blood. It has about twice as many amino, uh, uh, it has twice as many amino acids as I have uh, beads here, but it doesn't have an alphabet of two, it has an alphabet of 20 to draw from. So I have these members of the alphabet, I'm going to draw from an alphabet of 20, 574 feet long. There is a formula in switching theory for specificity, and if I apply that formula, it turns out the probability of getting any particular sequence of those amino acids would be one part in t with t to 10 with 650 zeros after it. Now, only one of them is hemoglobin. If you don't have the right hemoglobin, you end up having hemoglobinopathy, which is fatal. This is impossible to have happened by chance. Think of 10 to the 650th. There are only 10 to the 18th seconds in the history of the universe if you're presuming a 15 billion year life uh, 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 history. There are only 10 to the 66th atoms in our entire galaxy. There's only 10 to the 80th subatomic particles in our galaxy. These, this is, these are very large numbers, and we haven't even talked about 650 zeros, okay? Any probabilities greater than 10 to the 50th, in other words, 10 to the minus 50, any probability that is less likely than 10 with 50 zeros is defined in physics as absurd. It's called Borel's Law. There are reasons you need a cutoff for certain mathematical functions. That's what they've adopted. So a specificity of 10 to the 650th power is far beyond the realm of chance. The chance of getting a hemoglobin molecule by random chance is equivalent to winning the state lottery not just once, not just twice in a row, not three times in a row, but 90 days in a row. Now that's not very likely, okay? This is one of the reasons that we know from the Bible that God made the beast of the earth after his kind, the cattle after their kind, and everything that creepeth upon the earth after his kind. God thought that it was good. Why? They are digitally defined. Species are digitally defined. Let's take another example that's useful, I think. Let's take a single-celled creature called a monocelled bacteria. And it is driven through the fluid by a flagellum, a little tail that wiggles. We're going to examine just the part of this little tail and discover it doesn't just wiggle, it spins. And as we look at that more carefully, we discover that it's a very elegantly designed motor. It has about 40 parts, any one of which is missing, it doesn't work. It's got D-rings and studs and uh, all kinds of rotors and so forth. And uh, so, I'm suggesting that this is evidence of very skillful design, not the operation of random chance. Let me give you just one little errand to do. Let's make a model of the DNA, and uh, let's put it large enough so that we can deal with it. I want you to imagine yourself faced with this problem. The DNA, we're going to make it equivalent to two strands of monofilament fishing line, 125 miles long, and you're going to have to store this in a basketball without tangling. In fact, you want to design this system so that this 125 mile pair of uh, fishing lines can be unzipped, copied, and then restored on spools you're going to do all of this at three times the speed of an airplane propeller, and you've got to do this again and again and again where it never gets tangled up. How would you design such a thing? By random chance? Hardly. No, by incredibly skillful design. 
See, the basic question that faces us, which came first, the DNA or the proteins? You can't have proteins without the DNA, and you can't have DNA without the proteins. It takes protein to construct DNA, and it takes the DNA code to make the protein. It's a chicken and egg thing, in a sense. They both had to be created at the same time, and they both had to be created to a consistent system architecture. See, thoughts or language are not physical, but they do evidence design. So d the problem that the Darwinians have, they cannot explain the origin of life because they cannot explain the origin of information. And that's one of the central mysteries that lies behind the whole biotechnology thing. Let's take a look at Psalm 19. The heavens declare the glory of God. The ferment showeth His handiwork. Day unto day uttereth speech, and night unto night showeth knowledge. There is no speech or language where their voice is not heard. Their line has gone out throughout all the earth and their words to the end of the world. I want you to notice in this verse the information science that roots at this. The heavens declare the the day-to-day -day uttereth speech, showeth knowledge. So no speech or language where their voice is not heard. Their words. You notice that it's the thoughts and the language that undergird the entire universe. So the origin of information cannot be explained. <clears throat> Irreducible complexity refutes design by accident or chance. The irreducible complexity example of the motor on a bacteria flagellum. One of the things the cell go, undergoes is an incredible choreography every time it splits. Everybody knows where to go and what to do. It's like a ballet. That alone defies random theories. Digital codes demand pre-planning. They don't happen by chance. No system dependent upon subsystems can survive random failures. If you have a group of systems put together to be an overall system, and it de its livelihood depends on all the systems working, it cannot survive the failure of any one of those systems. Without, it ca cannot survive random failures. It's interesting to realize that all life comes from previous life. All cells derive from preceding cells. We have been unable to manufacture any single synthetic cell. That speaks volumes. Let's take another example. Let's talk about leaves for a minute. The brilliance of autumn leaves is due to the presence of accessory uh, leaf pigments that normally assist in the plant photosynthesis by capturing specific wavelengths of light. Uh, these pigments become visible, of course, when the leaf dies in the fall. If we look at the anatomy of a leaf, it is incredibly complex, in which um, there's uh, carbon dioxide absorbed by the leaf, there's water transferred to where it needs to go. It's a complex system design. Let's just, what we, when we let's take the leaf apart for a minute. Light hits the leaf, and carbon dioxide, dioxide hits the leaf, and all life derives from the light, which incidentally is the first quote of God in the Bible. The so-called Calvin cycle involves a complex electron transfer between two pigments, what's called the P700 and the P650, named after the wavelengths of light that it responds to, and a whole bunch of enzymes that process the carbon fixation, the glucose fabrication, and the aspiration of, of the air. It, takes, it adds water to all of this, and out comes a hydrocarbon, and a hydrocarbon is, uh, can be of any of uh, several different sizes. This happens to be a glucose uh, carbon. And if you uh, count up the carbon and uh, uh, so forth, you'll discover that when all this is done, they've got some oxygen left over. So the light and the CO2 hit the leaf along with water, and out comes the sugar, the, the glucose. But it has oxygen left over, which it expirates to the air. So we all know that process. The air comes from the leaf. Carbon dioxide goes to the leaf. Photosynthesis really means to build with light. And so what we have in leaves is sugar factories producing millions of new glucose mo molecules per second. Most plants produce more glucose than they can use and store themselves. And uh, so the carbohydrates uh, get stored in roots and stems and leaves and so forth. Each year, photosynthesizing organisms produce about 170 billion metric tons of extra carbohydrates, about 30 metric tons for every person on the planet Earth. So the plants produce the oxygen and the sugar that the animals, of all kinds, we included, need the oxygen and the sugar in various forms. The animals give off the CO2, which the plants need to complete the cycle. 
I want you to notice the complexity of both, not just the complexity of the animals, the complexity of the plants, but the fact that they're designed for each other. They can't exist, one can't exist without the other. Again, you've got evidence, you've got the fingerprints of the system designer all over this thing. Paul Davies, who's an atheistic scientist, brilliant man, published many, many books, he says, it seems as though somebody has fine-tuned the nature's numbers to make the universe. The impression of design is overwhelming. Those are his words. What he's describing is called by scientists what they call the anthropic principle. As they look at the universe in any field of science, and you look at the mathematics involved, it's as if everything has been tuned to fit man, to make man's life possible. And that's why they call it the anthropic principle. And uh, it's interesting, because it certainly has been. The appearance that the universe was designed for man, if you construct a mathematical model of what we believe we know about the universe, there are hundreds of delicate ratios that if altered the slightest, one part in a hundred thousand in one case, it would render life impossible. And of course, that sort of echoes in Psalm 139. For thou hast possessed my reins, thou hast covered me in my mo mother's womb. I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works, and that my soul knoweth right well. Thine eyes did see my substance, yet being incomplete. And in thy book all my members were written, which in continuance were fashioned, when as yet there was none of them. We were designed. So with that background, let's turn to microbiology, which I'm going to call the new sorcerer's apprentice, tampering with the engines of creation. You may recall the sorcerer's apprentice, it started by Johann Wolfgang von Goethe with uh, Der Zauberlehrling, which is the magic student, back in 1798, which was then turned into a musical piece by Paul Dukas called The Sorcerer's Apprentice and featured, of course, in Walt Disney's uh, famous Fantasia in 1940. It involved a student's spell, got not quite correct, which unleashed forces that proved uncontrollable. And his teacher had to intervene to terminate the impending disaster. That was the theme of the story. That's also what's going on, I believe, in the field of microbiology. Put yourself in this picture. You have a six-year-old that has a rare bone marrow disease, anemia, bleeding disorders, severe immune system problems, and is likely to die of leukemia within a year. Put yourself in that picture. The doctor tells you that there's a 90% chance of curing it with a cell transplant technique from an umbilical cord of a matched sibling, in other words, requiring the use of a screened embryo. We need to get an embryo that is, will be, in effect, a matched sibling to your child, and from that, get a cell transplant that'll save her. What would you do? Well, no question what you'd do. And it's, this is an actual case, by the way. Molly Nash was born with Fanconi anemia, destined for leukemia. The only effective treatment is to get a batch of healthy cells from a perfectly matched sibling to replace the child's faulty bone marrow cells. Since each parent carries both a normal and a faulty version of Fanconi's gene, each pregnancy has a 25% chance of an affected child. Embryos are screened by a standard in uh, vitro uh, fertilization in a laboratory dish and tested for the presence of the disease gene. Only those testing normal are then transferred to a woman's uterus. Only two of the 15 tested normal. Only one was healthy enough for transfer to Lisa Nash's womb. And we have a designer baby that saves a sister. The Colorado couple used genetic tests to create a test tube baby that would have the exact type of cells desperately needed to save their six-year-old daughter. She now has a 90% chance of being free of the Morrow disease. Genetic screening is clearly going to be part of our future. And this is a real case of real people that are doing well. This brings up a whole subject of differentiated cells. Psychokinesis results in identical cells. A cell divides and you get a duplicate. Those two divide, you get a duplicate. Everyone's, you always divide, you get a duplicate. And as you watch this, but you'll notice something, as this continues, they no longer divide uniformly. You have a, a uh, they grow and pretty soon they start taking more and more shape until finally you have a formed series of cells that made different tissues. Some became bone, some became cortical tissue, etc. There are Carnegie stages, they, they go through definitive stages, we know how they go. 
See, the one before it differentiates itself, it's called a stem cell. There's a code of four that defines the tw uh, 20 amino acids, that, out of which are compiled over 100,000 different kinds of proteins. That's all part of the cell division. What we do, though, we take that stem cell before it's specialized, before it gets differentiated into bone, muscle, cortical, whatever, it, we, it eventually will become 200 different kinds of cells, which then become the tissues and the organs. You'll have 10 to the 13th, 10 with 13 zeros after it, that cells in total. What you do is you interrupt this process with what's called nuclear transfer. You catch that stem cell and you replace its nucleus with the nucleus of a donor and then you get what we call cloning because you will then, if, every, if everything happens to go well, you'll end up with a replica of the donor that donated the cell, the, the nucleus of the cell. That's what we, it's nuclear tr cell transfer but it's called colloquially cloning. And of course we had a clone in sheep's clothing with the famous dolly. The thing that made that possible was the technology of a needle making machine that could remove that cell, the nucleus of a cell and place it in another one. And uh, the nucleus removal ended up creating dolly from a surrogate mother. And so that made history of course. It wasn't actually the first but it was the, certainly the first big publicized one. So cloning now has become common in monkeys, pigs, uh, animals of all kinds. In fact, just recently, we have a um, fluorescent green protein uh, put in embryonic pigs in uh, Taiwan. And uh, they, uh, they actually glow, and the organs internally also glow. Uh, I'm not sure what's been accomplished by it, but it shows that these kinds of explorations are becoming quite common. One of the questions that we don't really know why, why and when do replicating cells no longer remain identical? See, genetic engineering is basically the manipulation of stem cells to produce desired tissues through nuclear transfer, what's called cloning, to replicate complete beings, ultimately. This obviously has huge moral, ethical, and legal, and I might even add theological issues. Some of the issues. When does tampering with an embryo become murder? Big question. Remember when John the Baptist started his ministry? He was nine inches long, weighed a pound and a half, and he was in his mother's womb where he jumped for joy and was spirit-filled. When does tampering with an embryo become murder? Is it acceptable to clone a baby to save a child's life, like in Molly Nash? And when does human life begin? Basic question. How will clones, the experts say that it's just a matter of time before we will clone human beings, okay. How will they affect our society? Will they be second-class citizens? And what's the theology of that? Can a clone become saved? These are questions that are going to be, have to be dealt with. And what are the prophetic implications of cloning? That's a whole other issue. Now let's talk a little bit about stem cell breakthroughs. We've heard a lot about this. Wu Suk Wong, a South Korean scientist, became a national hero in South Korea. In May of 2005, Huang and his team announced that they had successfully cloned a human embryo for scientific research. Wow. In August, Huang announced that he successfully cloned a dog, an Afghan hound named Snuppy, by a somatic nuclear transfer. But then suddenly the balloon fizzles. In November of 2005, Gerald Shatner, University of Pittsburgh researcher, after two years with Huang, ceased his collaboration. On December 23rd, an official probe discovered that at least nine of the 11 stem cell lines were faked. Huang had intentionally fabricated his stem cell research results. So suddenly we had stem cell meltdown about a lottery. They thought science was a peer-reviewed journal. It's a very highly reputable one, but not peer-reviewed. The mainstream press, virtually intoxicated with embryonic research, will, now, will they now finally acknowledge the adult and umbilical cord blood cell successes? See, the real successes have been in adult cells. We'll get to that in a minute. Ethics can be forgotten as other nations and private companies race to fill the void left by the president's reluctance to fund stem cell research. This is what the Albany Times Union printed. Only a, a properly funded U.S. stem cell research program will guarantee oversight and the protection of all involved. They missed the point. See, the spin doctors are starting. The core values of integrity and objectivity are being prostituted by the passionate political pursuit of a legal license to clone. Human cloning has been promoted through the propaganda techniques of misrepresentation, exaggeration, and false hope for the suffering. 
In California, there was a deceptive 35 million political campaign convinced, that convinced uh, California voters to pass Proposition 71 last year. It authorized the state to borrow $3 billion to subsidize research into somatic cell nuclear transfer cloning and embryonic stem cells. By the way, I thought we had, it was the, the state so proud of its venture capital industry. Where were the state's venture capitalists? Were they caught napping? Did they miss this, or are they just smarter than that? And by the way, this $3 billion is going to cost the California voters $6 billion over a period of 30 years. Half of that sum will go to pay the interest on the debt. And this is by a state that's already strapped for funding. Robert Klein, the driving force behind the initiative, assured voters that the universities and private firms receiving grants would share one billion or more in royalties with the state. He knew before the election that such royalty sharing by the state would be hampered by federal regulations. This is highlighted in the San Francisco Chronicle. The point is there's deliberate deceit involved. When the opponents of Proposition 71 asserted in the official ballot arguments that the initiative would subsidize human cloning, the pro-71 campaign sued to prevent the argument from being mentioned in the state's voter election guide. Fortunately, the, even though the initiative, by the way, explicitly created a state constitutional right to conduct human somatic cell transfer, fortunately the judge saw right through the ruse and ruled that the human cloning was at the heart of the initiative. It still passed, unfortunately. This ongoing hype reached cruel heights in the wake of President Reagan's death from Alzheimer's disease. Human cloning advocates argued that Alzheimer's could be cured if only the impediments to federally funded embryonic stem cell research were pushed out of the way. That's more than a long shot. Alzheimer's is, an extremely, is extremely unlikely to ever be effectively treated by, with stem cells, whether cloned or natural. Stem cell experts reluctantly confess of all the diseases that might someday be cured by embryonic stem cell treatments, Alzheimer's is among the least likely to benefit. They were just taking, taking advantage of the politics here. And it's all because Alzheimer's is a whole brain disease that involves the loss of huge numbers and varieties of brains, 100 billion nerve cells, and countless connections among them. This is all published in the Washington Post and elsewhere. If stem cells have little practical potential to treat Alzheimer's, why do proponents of cloned embryo research continue to invoke a cure for Alzheimer's in their sales pitches? Ronald McKay said it. He said, people need a fairy tale. Maybe that's unfair, but they need a storyline that's relatively simple to understand. Ronald McKay, he's the stem cell researcher for the National Institute of Neurological Disorders and Stroke. So the quest continues. Cloning proponents in this country are avid in their desire for billions in federal and state money to pay for morally problematic and highly speculative research that the private sector generally shuns. By the way, the UK privately uh, recently announced, the UK recently announced that they will spend a billion pounds on biotechnology by 2008. Now let's make some distinctions that are missed by the illiterate press. There are distinctive different kinds of stem cells. There are embryonic stem cells that come from cloning, som somatic cell nuclear transfer, reproductive cl cloning in some sense, or therapeutic cloning like in the Molly Nash thing. There's also ad adult stem cells easily available. They can be safely extracted from various places in the human body, such as fatty tissue, blood, or bone marrow. They're adult, they're still stem cells, but they're, they don't require a murdering a embryo. Adult stem cells are the better alternative. They're already being used to treat diseases. There's less risk involved. It does not require the destruction of human embryos. Adult stem cells typically generate the cell types of the tissue in which they reside. A blood-forming adult stem cell in the bone marrow normally gives rise to many types of blood cells, such as red blood cells, white blood cells, and platelets, and so forth. Recent re experiments indicate that stem cells from one tissue may be able to yield cell types of a completely different tissue. Blood cells becoming neurons. Liver cells that can be made to produce insulin. Stem cells from bone marrow that can develop into heart muscle and so forth. Let's talk about a few cases. Adult cells transplanted from nasal tissue into the spinal cord help to heal damaged tissue. 26 patients were able to regain sensation in the lower body, bladder control, and even arm and leg movement. Some paralysis patients were able to walk less than a year after having the surgery. Some other examples, heart disease and cardiac degeneration, corneal degeneration. Over 20 patients treated in a recent study, 16 either regained their sight or experienced increased levels of vision. Autoimmune diseases such as lupus, Crohn's, 
multiple sclerosis, and even diabetes have been treated using adults themselves. Of 250 diabetics, 200 did not have to take insulin shots for over a year after having adult stem cell transplants. A research team at Harvard University observed a complete reversal of juvenile di diabetes in mice using adult spleen cells, and they are currently preparing to begin their first patient trials. Five Parkinson's disease patients were given a protein injection that stimulated adult stem cells in the brain. Patient symptoms lessened. They demonstrated a 61% increase in physical coordination. Adult, adult stem cell plants are also widely used to treat anemia, leukemia, lymphomas, and other cancers. See, adult, that is post-birth stem cells, are taken from the umbilical cord, blood, bone marrow, extracted from fat cells. Most often these stem cells are taken from the patient's own body. This ensures against rejection, which is half the risk. Donated cells are properly matched, don't have the associated mutation issues. In Germany, a paraplegic South Korean woman was treated with stem cells from an umbilical cord blood. At a news conference in Seoul on November 25, 2004, she walked with the help of a walker. She had been paralyzed for 20 years, and she walked, although with a walker. Over two years ago, a young girl in Germany fell and destroyed over 19 square inches of her skull. After several other procedures were attempted, all of which failed, a paste of extracted pelvic bone and her fat cells was mixed together and administered. A press conference was held to report the skull bone, although thin, had regrown. The girl, after having worn a helmet for some two years, formally took it off. At the Heart Institute in Houston, Texas, four out of a group of five severely sick Brazilian heart patients were taken off the heart transplant list. Doctors harvested some of the patient's own bone marrow injected into their hearts. The patients had such an increase in blood supply after the procedure that in October 2003, they were no longer in need of a transplant. The four were part of a larger group of 14 that were reported to have improved heart function. Cancer patients. Researchers in Texas developed a method of delivering cancer-fighting interferon beta through the use of stem cells taken from bone marrow. And since stem cells have an apparent affinity to aid growth, they are attracted to tumors. Once the stem cells have been manipulated with the interferon beta, they, they become targeted missiles aimed at the cancer's tumor, leaving healthy cells untouched. This is still in the animal research stage, but should get approval for human testing this year. And since the patient's own cells are used, with proper screening, there's little danger. Others include degenerative blindness, di diabetes, muscular dystrophy, Parkinson's disease, leukemia, and so forth. If we're truly attempting to do away with paralysis, genetic disease, and systemic uh, deficiencies, adult stem cell therapy appears to be an answer. The debate on stem cell research shouldn't be over the ethics of using fetal stem cells, but on whether they're even necessary to solving our medical needs. And there are all kinds of potential genetic remedies for mental retardation, muscular dystrophy, cystic fibrosis, and the list goes on. I want you to look at the scoreboard. Embryonic stem cells, zero. Adult stem cells in the thousands. That's the scoreboard. Hardly seems like a game worth watching, doesn't it? The adult stem cells are the answer, and they don't have the controversy. In our next session, we're going to take the dark side of all of this. I'll call it the Pandora's box. We're talking about chimera, agrogenetics, genetic athletes, and the biblical precedents. See you in the next session.